apartments to stay in and but right now it's a place where we have to stay in so it's a it's a mixed uh, blessing but you know we are lucky that um most of us at least you know have uh, have shelter or have food have loved ones with it or if we are alone um, find a way to to connect to the world it is again uh, the time of corona it's getting bigger and bigger we thought over the summer was a bit more behind us um it is uh, looming like a dark cloud and it's coming closer on the horizon also it's election week it's a historic time it's a historic moment in the history of the united states over centuries this is a, a, a week that's coming up uh, that will decide a lot of things. Uh, and um, artists, as we always say, are part of change. Artists are the ones who are on the right side of history, on the right side, the complex struggle for freedom and the idea to encompass and work for, for the art, for theater, for performance, all possible views. You can look at it in different ways from here and there. You, or character speaks from different sides or um, uh, uh, expressions are open to for reflection. And it's about what the people think who, who, who watch it and connect to it. So it's a form of democratic participation in society with the hope to change, to make a contribution. It has never been more important. It is terribly missing. This is what I miss so much. And, uh, but it's also a time now to reflect, what do we need? What is necessary? What was wrong before? What is the right thing to do? And it's so hard to see all these questions. So we're here not to explain, but we're here to explore. And this week still, we are in the second week of the Siegel Center's uh, Prelude Festival for over 15 years. We invite New York artists and companies and only New York artists and companies. So it's very unique to the city over decades has supported um, um, the field um, to show their work in progress and to talk about it and to see what is the meaning uh, behind it, what is it good for, like very simple questions. And, um, and uh, again, uh, this is happening this week. So with us here are fantastic uh, 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 prelude artist, uh, Julia uh, Lowe um, and uh, uh, Dina Igusti, Landria Lesseur and Stefania. Bulbarella, they're all with us here with uh, David uh, Brun, the curator, to Desa with Miranda Harmon. He is uh, curating the festival. David is a, a dramaturg, a critic, and a doctoral candidate at Yale University, the School of Drama, where he studies contemporary theater and performance. But of course, we think he really studies theater and performance at the Prelude Festival and with us. So uh, David, uh, tell us a little bit um, about uh, what's behind the idea of this year's uh, festival and uh, why did you choose our guests. Sure. Thank you, Frank. You know, the theme of this year's festival is Sites of Revolution. It's kind of the animating idea. And Miranda Heyman, my co-curator and I, were interested in the ways that revolution was playing out. Um, obviously, there was the kind of standard repertoire of revolution happening with the uprisings this summer, along with various other protests. Um, you can also think of uh, mutual aid as an you know integral part of that. Uh, but we were also interested in ways that it was playing out uh, between loved ones and in different time signatures. So very brief moments, but also very long throws of history uh, within family relationships, but also histories of nations. And in the case of, of Eugenia Lowe and her work, this relationship between animals and humans, which you're extremely interested in. So um, that kind of thematically was really pulsing. You know, that was um, exciting our imaginations. I would say, you know, it's what's great about the festival, what's always been great about the festival is that it's been an opportunity to bring together theater, performance, dance, and interesting combinations. You know, past festivals have featured food as performance and virtual reality in addition to things that you might recognize uh, under the rubric of theater or, or dance theater or performance. Um, all of the artists we have gathered here today are, are, are really fascinating and exciting to me, not only because they've, you know, found a way to use the digital platforms as a way to showcase the work, but also because they're integrating and um, combining so many different forms. So, you know, with Eugia's work, there's musical theater and animation and this really um, interesting battle between humans and animals. With Dina's work, there's poetry. Um, you know, Dina's a very accomplished poet and I've always been interested in the role of poetics and prosody and how that has informed theater from the very beginning. So in some ways it's very new, but also uh, the most ancient part of, of the art form. You know, Leandra works across various media um, using the gallery space in incredibly interesting ways with video, but also performances in which Leandra's present in the performance. So um, that's all exciting to me. And Stefania works as both a director and a video designer. And so I think designers 
really have a role to play in becoming more and more lead artists as theaters are experimenting with, you know, what type of work we might be able to showcase, fund, you know, what kind of collaborations we might be able to build. Um, so even though, as we've said on these talks before, the theater industry is really at a very difficult time, um, healthcare being maybe, you know, one of the most acute crises facing people who are, are working in the so-called field. Um, I've been very excited just by the four artists on this talk, but also everyone in the festival and the way they're rethinking the form. So maybe Frank, we could, we could do introductions. People could tell yeah. a little about who they are in their project. And maybe I'll recommend that we go in the order of when their work has shown or will show. So we'll start uh, with Dina and then uh, Stefania, their work has already been presented and is available. And then uh, Eugia and Leandra uh, will, will follow them. Hi, uh, my name is Dina Agusti, as David and Frank have mentioned before. I am a poet and the author of Cut Woman, which is published with Game of Book Books. And the work that I did for Prelude is a choreo poem of excerpts of that piece. And the whole piece kind of centers around the concept of death and grieving and how do you navigate anticipated loss, especially when it comes to a queer Muslim Indonesian a body that is a survivor of female genital mutilation. And you also performed uh, the work, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, Stefania. Hi, everyone. I'm Stefania Ulvarela. Uh, I'm in New York currently. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And in Prelude, I worked on Una Niña, Una Familia, Un Pueblo that is, um, it's the beginning of an adaptation of my grandma's memories when she left Italy uh, in, during the Second World War and arrived to Argentina and created her whole life there. So it's the beginning of an exploration of where do I meet my grandma as an immigrant? Um, so kind of going, navigating the past and the present. Um, and it was the first time that we could start trying it out with actors. So it was actually really helpful to understand where the story wants to go and how we want to keep on building the story and telling the story. Um, so yeah, that was my piece at Prelude. Hi, my name is Yujia. Um, I'm an actor, musician and a theater maker, and I'm also a music director. Um, and a accompanist. Um, what I'm showing for Prelude this time is, uh, it's a show called Animal Empire. It's a work in progress. Um, it's about the fall of the hum of humans, of human supremacy and about animals um, overtaking the human race in various forms. So our pets attack us, um, the zoo animals riot, the wild animals invade the cities, uh, the insects come up on the ground, um, all kinds of stuff that are totally plausible to happen, but just haven't happened yet. Um, yeah, and it's going to be eventually a digital short film uh, using emojis and various other like foam technologies. Yeah. Hi, my name is Leandra Lasour, um, based out of Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, my piece, Passing Time with Grace, uh, specifically about kind of how we speak to ourselves, how we kind of navigate this question of grace and what it means to accept grace, what it means to show yourself grace, show others grace. Um, so it's a piece that incorporates language. It's a piece that incorporates movement in order to kind of process um, these kind of negative uh, projections and feelings uh, that deal with like how we process trauma. Um, and then also thinking about like the resolve in, in coming to terms with understanding you know, one's and understanding the idea and this image of, of what grace truly looks and feel like when you when you reach that point. Mm. Well, it's a, a real variety um, of work really covering, I think, contemporary theater and performance. How, how does it feel for all of you? To produce something where you're not, it's not clear where, where it will be shown, when, in what form, definitely most probably not designed for a screen, but now you do it here in a time of Corona, maybe you can share a bit of how, how you how you experiencing this moment.
Oh, unless I want to go. Um, for me, it's been an interesting process. I think like, especially for me as a poet, initially I've always kind of worked within the digital space and also working in performance poetry, a lot of how we navigate the medium or the poets navigate the medium is more so in the digital space because of digital publishing, because of video. So at first the idea of it not being in a tangible physical space was kind of daunting, but I felt like it gave a lot more room to kind of play with not necessarily emulating physical space as much as possible, but kind of delving into what is actually available. So focusing more on like the importance of the internet in this work and focusing more on like the importance of like not being in a tangible physical space where people are actually watching you, but interrogating the ways in which people watch you outside of a stage or some other reading or something along those lines, but for instance, like through a camera and do all these things. I can also speak to, to this um, as a video designer or projection designer. Um, I'm generally used to thinking about video in relation to bodies on space now, and but now we just see it through a screen. And what I've been what what I've been encountering lately is that as a video designer, I come into a process, into a rehearsal process, much earlier, like that we're used to in in what we used to do before. So it's not that we only have a production meeting and we meet once a week. I'm in rehearsal. And even sometimes if, depending on the project, we're working with OBS at the moment. And that is what- yes. Can you explain? Yeah. OBS, oh yes. What a world. <laughs> OBS is a software that we are currently using, some of us. There's a few other options, but well, not many actually, but OBS is one of them. It's a software that allows us to live, kind of live VJ as we are capturing a Zoom meeting. So what we'll do is bring in the Zoom meeting, crop the Zoom meeting and bring it into OBS. And then what OBS is streaming the product and OBS will let us like change the background. Um, if actors have a green screen, we can change it to, so they can be in a space we wanna choose. We can put them together on the same space. We can add text, we can add effects, we can add a few things. Um, I've been like coming from programming QLab and it's Adora. I'm like, how do I do pre-weights on OBS? This can't allow this. It's another world, it's a new world and we're getting used to it. Tech is weird. Tech, it's like, ah, how I'm communicating, I'm not seeing anyone. It's a new world, I, I miss being in tech with all the people in the room. Can't wait to be there. But yeah, what's, what, what the great thing about it is, is as a designer, I come in very early in the process and the video informs the story and the atmosphere as well as the actors inform the video, which is not, we're getting into tech and seeing it for the first time. And in one week, one week and a half trying to build this world, which is actually so rewarding. And I think the process changes completely. Um, I think for me, uh, in terms of where I, you know, how is it like not knowing where this project is going? Um, I pretty much, I think it was like earlier in maybe May or even early June where I just kind of ditched my old ideas that I had been working on and was like, okay, this is obviously gonna, you know, be happening for a while. And so I made a list of like all my ideas and then I looked at them and was like, okay, what, which of these ideas would no one has to be touching. Um, it can doesn't require lots of people around. Um, it could maybe use some kind of creative audience seating or audience participation. Um, and then from there, it's like, okay, well, this seems to be the project to work on now. And it's like most feasible. Um, and then I also made like a whole list of like things that I didn't just want to be like, okay, let's work with what we have, but to like capitalize on the atmosphere now like okay so we're all stuck in this digital space like instead of just making do with it what could we possibly do that takes that further like makes use of it um and I think just during that period of time maybe like in May or April 
I was looking at my phone a lot <laughs> and just realizing that like there's so much technology on our phone these days with like I think that was also when the whole TikTok thing was, I don't even know what it, you know, I don't know what month was was, was everything. Um, where, you know, like TikTok, which I had never explored before, but like there's so many filters on these apps, like TikTok, Instagram, our MacBook, like the photo booth, uh, even Zoom. There's like, there's like so many filters, options, things that you can do. And like, I'm not a tech person at all. So even like me learning how to use a filter is like, Oh, a filter. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was like, it, I was surprised to kind of realize that no one had really done a movie or I hadn't heard about a movie where you literally like use the N emojis on your phone. Like I'm like, it's almost like, you know, the movie um, emoji or something. There's some big Hollywood movie emoji like that could have been done using your iPhone technically on like a green screen. Um, so that was what that, that that's been my hit space for the past few months but it's definitely been like um the the end result is definitely meant for the digital world and not meant to be engaged in any way yeah yeah i was going to add as um like thinking about my work and performance uh i've always thought about how the body responds to this idea of like the spectacle um, and so for me, I've always tried to create spaces uh, where I'm creating this intimacy, um, not with the audience necessarily, but with myself. And so I think in this time that we're in now, um, in this like digital landscape where everything now is digital, like as creators, we now have more agency and power over how our work is viewed and in what ways um, the audience takes in what we're trying to say and how we're trying to say that. And so for me, it almost became natural to have this, this kind of way or this mode of creating um, because I was able to kind of, you know, have agency and control over how my body is, is viewed and how my body is interacted within this kind of digital space. And uh, do you feel it is wor it's working? Did you? How did you? What, what do you think about what you produce as a step in the process? What did you learn? I mean, personally, there's a lot of things that I've learned. Um, I did learn that this could be definitely workshopped via we assume till we get into a space but i feel that i realize this piece is not meant to live in the digital world mm -hmm. um i'm happy to to develop it through this world and start developing it but in my case at least uh yeah i'd rather wait for us to be able to convene in a, in a rehearsal room once again You know, have you done your have you done your your piece a cut woman as a performance on a stage I <clears> said of... you did was that living room with a bed and all that is that <clears throat> no that was actually my first time doing it kind of more in like a more intimate setting so prior to cut woman I usually just read my poems or perform them on stage it's just myself and a microphone and there's just a huge audience and most of the time I can't see them so I'm not really concerned about myself. So Leandra, what you were saying before about feeling a sense of agency, I kind of felt that more, I usually feel that more on stage because oftentimes I'm not concerned about the audience. But with this piece, I felt the slight opposite where like while I did have agency, I felt like I was more hyper aware of how I was being seen. I think like while I was able to kind of control the ways in which I was being seen in terms of like, I can add a filter when I need to, I can blur things out if I want to. I think doing it in an intimate setting as a living room and a bedroom made it feel more personal. It made me tie back to where and why I wrote it, which was oftentimes in my bedroom and a living room behind a computer screen, analyzing everything that has happened um, and kind of writing in response to that. So I kind of felt like the why and how I'm producing or how I'm presenting it kind of merged in a way. And I think 
emotionally I had to step out of myself in a particular way where like while I know that I am performing I can't re-trigger myself in a way just because the settings feel intimate when I first wrote the pieces. Eugenia, were you going to speak earlier? Uh, yeah, in, in response to like Stefania's work, I saw her piece on the on YouTube on the on the website, and like there were certain moments. I know you said like this definitely belongs in the not digital space, but there were certain moments. I think especially the the giving birth scenes. It's just funny to like be staring at your screen, and then like you feel like you're on a call, on a Zoom call with someone who's giving birth, um, and then the person's like screaming. There's just something like funny about that. And I feel like we've seen people giving birth on stage. And yeah, there was definitely something interesting about, <laughs> about that. Yeah. In terms of like, for me, I think about, you know, whether what I've noticed is that um, in terms of, you know, working digitally and stuff like that, I think I used to be like, you know, as, I think as theater people, we were like, oh, live performance is like always the way to go. Um, but I think over the course of the past few months, I've kind of like seen the value of having a digital medium as well, because not only because um, it makes you creative in different ways and you can do different things, but just the fact that it's always there, you have, you have like at least one kind of art or piece or product that's always there um, and can be watched or accessible at any time, which I realize is very valuable in such a, when weird things happen like this pandemic, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is um, <clears throat> many art historians, also literary historians said when uh, a new technology started, um, let's say Goethe and Schiller, the writers they had wrote was their feathers, you know, their, their quills on the inside, you know, uh, horse carriages, and then a typewriter came, you know, who changed the writing in a way that um, this was the entrance of women into the workforce, you know, and uh, and all this sudden stuff got typed up and the, the first readers, you know, were the, the typists and the man couldn't write the way anymore. They were confused about it because they were making fun of him. Kafka went back from typewriting actually, you know, to dictating and then um, had it someone, um, 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 write it by hand and it was important to him and then the computer came up of stuff was seen on film and um, so when it, or Bronsier, a French philosopher says if a traditional art encounters a new technology something radically changes these are the real changes and not you know artists in that sense the romantic genius idea who does it now we do have zoom we have this interruption um, as a question to you do you feel uh, this is uh, that's just the time you will get over. We will go back to where we are. Do you feel actually this is really radically changing the way we think, <clears throat> or um, it will be will be both? So I just to know how you at this moment experience that. Is that influencing you in a fundamental way, or is it just a way to deal with a moment and then you will adapt going back to what it, we all were trying to do before? That's a great question. And I have a lot of mixed feelings in terms of while, like, yes, we all miss theater and we all miss like being in physical space. I think this time and especially seeing theater and digital space kind of blew the theater industry wide open, especially in terms of accessibility and in terms of agency and in terms of who gets to make art but who gets to see art. Like I know in the beginning of this time, there were a lot of criticisms of theaters who suddenly had live streams and had free programs for things and performances that were usually like $50 plus. And unless you were a student, you weren't able to access that. Um, I've been seeing kind of just other ways in which like people have like played with subscription systems in order to give like cheaper options, but also accessibility in terms of, well, if you are hearing impaired, how are you accommodating to that? If you're visually impaired, how are you designing things and how are you creating things in which like you are also accommodating to those people as well? So I think whether or not we stay in this moment heavily depends on this administration and heavily depends on how we are as a whole community. But I don't, and while again, we there are aspects of theater that I definitely miss and being on stage is great. 
I don't want this to be this temporary moment where we're like, okay, we only did it because of this pandemic and then we're gone. No, we have to take away a lot of these things. We have to take away like the role of classicism and the roles of accessibility and the roles of elitism that the theater industry unfortunately has had for years and kind of remove those systems as much as we can. Yeah, something that happened while I was working on this project, um, it was that I worked with five actresses, four in Argentina and one in Brazil, while I'm in New York. So that could have never happened before where I'm in New York and they are in another country, thousands of kilometers away. Um, so that was kind of in, like, I was like surprised of that is even possible when I could have never imagined it before. Um, I do, you know, I want to go back to the theater. Um, don't like, as Dana was saying, I'm like, yeah, true. I don't want this to go by this time to go by. And it's like, oh, we're, we're, we're here till we get there. I do think that great things are coming out from this moment we're going through. Uh, and there's a lot of things that I'm learning or exploring that I would have never explored before. And I think they will translate in a way to what's gonna come in the future. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's, uh, it's, it will be, <clears throat> it will be, it's a big question. I think it was the American dancer, Louis Fuller. I think she was in 1880 or whatever. She danced in Paris, a classical dance, but she had, heard of light or electric light and shit. How about putting a filter as Julia just now said, you know, how would I put blue in front of it? So she got some guy to do some cobalt, uh, you know, uh, thing on a, on a piece of glass. And she held, I think, 40 patterns on it. And people went crazy. She did her dance and white rocks. Everybody seen, but all of a sudden she had 20 colors and something changed, you know, and she also, you know, it helped to guide, you know, people into, into something that's coming and that will be coming in. And the question is, you know, what will, what will happen? What will be the adaptations of it? You know, the first cars looked like horse carriages, you know, but it was not about it, you know? And um, so the real question is what will, what will this moment do? David, you as a curator, do you detect a change? Do you feel um, something truly different is happening at the moment? I'm optimistic about, well, as I've said on other talks, but I'll repeat here, I'm very optimistic about the artistry and the vision and resourcefulness and willingness to collaborate and also willingness to adapt by artists. I mean, that festival, if, if it's anything, I, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I feel like Miranda would support this well. It's a love letter to that kind of um, generosity, creativity, and labor that I see everywhere in artists. To me, it's about the industries, whether it's the theater industry or the art world, so-called, you know, that are threatening <laughs> the, the art in some ways, and, uh, or the ability for art to be a place where people can gather freely. And of course, the the burden of that tension or the burden of those failures falls disproportionately on black people, indigenous people, people of color, uh, gender non-conforming people. We know these uh, systemic injustices and they're they're exacerbated. I'm very hopeful that you know I've been in New York in and around New York for about ten years. Um, as I said, we had a panel about the gala um, as an idea as a site that can has a tendency to amplify those injustices and inequities. One of the panelists said it had the feeling of a caste system, which I think is apt. I mean, the fact that three theater professionals, very established in their field, two of them, you know, embedded in and working at very important institutions, so who are up in the public, we're on a public panel and we're talking about decolonizing wealth. That was, to me, unimaginable 10 years ago, you know? And I mean, I remember when Oscar Eustace went on OK Radio, which was a podcast the collected the Nature Theater of Oklahoma hosted and said publicly when they were doing the renovations for the public theater lobby, I need a space where rich people can go. And I mean, that that would just be grounds for termination maybe at this point, um, certainly a kind of reckoning. So I've been really inspired by um, how artists have self-organized in the context of the theater with uh, we see you white American theater that this wasn't sanctioned by a collective or body. It was a grassroots movement 
that was very inspiring, uh, as well as the theater partnerships with mutual aid organizations, that some of which we featured, you know, earlier in the festival. Um, so again, I'm I'm optimistic about art. I'm less optimistic about the lack of healthcare or the difficulty of getting healthcare. Um, again, I sound like a broken record, but this is incredibly important to me, um, not only personally but but for the entire field. Um, I have a question for the people on the call, kind of building off of this that Frank asked yesterday that I thought was really um, interesting responses, but all of us kind of in some ways intersect with New York City. Um, and I'm curious what people's thoughts are about the future of the city. Obviously, it seems like every day in Fox News, they're talking about how terrible it is. Um, so there's a certain need to push back against that. But there's also real cause for concern, uh, given, you know, that cost of living doesn't seem to be dropping down drastically. Um, you know, I'll just say that one of my hopes would be that they would turn class B and class C office space, which is not first floor office space. Uh, the city should buy it. They should do some small renovations to soundproof it and give it to artists um, because people are not going back to those offices. They're just going to sit there. So I think, and this was a proposal by a group several years ago, the Center for an Urban Future. So I'm just, I'm cosplaying them at the moment. I mean, but that'd be my great hope is that we could solve this space problem because it was crippling before. It doesn't seem to be changing. Honestly, I know we can't gather now, but that'd be my greatest hope that studio space would just be wide open to, to anyone who wanted to use it. But I'd love to hear from the panel, of course. What are your thoughts on the future of New York City as a arts ecosystem and as a home? And maybe, um, Leandra, I'd actually be curious to hear from you because you have, um, you've worked in, in maybe the gallery context and it seems to me like galleries are coming back in a certain way. Obviously, the major museums are open with restrictions and things, but I, I've seen news of smaller galleries. I'm not sure if microscopes open, but um, you know, I'm, I'm curious maybe from someone who works outside the traditional theater um, ecosystem, what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great question, David. Um, I mean, in terms of just the arts in general, galleries like, you know, mid-range galleries, larger galleries, smaller galleries, um, I think all of, the, all of them are struggling um, to try to figure out ways to engage um, and ways to get people to come see work in person. Um, so they've been heavily reliant right now on this kind of digital landscape. Um, but I think in, in regards to the city and where the city's at and my thoughts on that, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, for me, sometimes some days I feel like it's very grim in terms of the outlook and on, on other days, it seems like uh, the, the way that we can go is, is more positive. Um, and I think that's because it depends on the people of the city and how we kind of like rethink space and rethink, you know, what we can do with the, the space that we have, what we can do within space in the parameters of, of, of what's happening right now in the world. Um, and so I think that's right, why right now artists are so important to that thought process and to like creatively rethinking like what is space, like how do we, you know, interpret space, like how do we like recreate space, but also um, how do we build and make space out of no space. Um, and so that's why for me, this kind of move into this digital space or digital landscape um, has been important and has been something that I feel I have that I felt has been really, really key in like organizing, but also a key in just like providing a voice for people who have sometimes been voiceless because they haven't had the actual space to do they what they need to. Um, so that's where the positive comes in for me in, in thinking about that and thinking about how artists are kind of taking the charge in, in the ways that we're thinking about future and the ways we're thinking about space. And also thinking, thinking about space now that I hadn't thought about it, there was, this was possible to make our, my piece because we had a space, the actors had their own space to rehearse in. Maybe if, if, I, if they didn't have their own space and we were rehearsing each one in their house, I wouldn't have been able to start developing this piece at all because after all, I need to, to, to eat and pay rent. So I'm always working on projects that will hire me as a video designer. And sometimes like directing was left to the side because maybe the projects I would love to, to sort of like 
self-produce or direct, I don't have time because I need to be working on other stuff to, to pay rent and to eat. So this actually has worked because there was a space and yes, this is crazy now. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, I guess in response to David and like his, you sound rather optimistic about space going forward. And I'm just like, not that optimist. I mean, um, for me, I used to use Spaceworks quite a lot. So they have, I don't know if people have used Spaceworks. So they have um, studio space in Long Island City in Brooklyn, a few spaces in Brooklyn. And I think they have some, they kind of regulate some space at Abrams Art Center as well. And they were, I think one of the cheapest ones was like $10 an hour. Um, they had music rooms for $10 an hour. It was like, there was a drum set, there was, you know, guitars, bass, you could, you know, it was great. And I think they closed in June, uh, July or June. Um, so I was really sad to hear that. and. I mean, I think that for me kind of uh, indicates <laughs> where, you know, it, pretty much I expect that getting space as an artist is always going to be difficult. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm not too optimistic about that, yeah. I feel like with the question of space, and I'm coming from this from the place of not only being an artist that is in New York, but someone who was born and raised in New York and has been displaced and has been affected by gentrification due to art washing and expansion of arts industries and arts institutions. So when we interrogate space and when we talk about space, I think while yes, there needs to be room for artists in order to create art, we have to also be mindful of space for who and being mindful of who is the space for? Is it space for obviously artists that are going to raise prices and displace black and brown people of color who've lived here for years? Or is it going to be a space where it is actually gonna be shared with other aspects of the community? Because I think like, and I'm sorry if I'm getting slightly emotional about it, but I think it is important for there to be art spaces. But I think as artists who always wanna be on the right side of history, we have to talk about the ways in which we've been wrong and also talk about how when we've talked about space, like what does it mean and who and which artists and for who, right? Like, yes, I am a theater artist, but also when I was 12, I was evicted because NYU created an expansion of their theater program, you know? Like, so I think I do have some hope for New York in terms of repurposing and reusing space but I think as artists, we have to really interrogate the implications of creating spaces and repurposing spaces. And what does it mean for there to have been no space? And what does it mean for there to be an empty space, especially with regards to housing? Yeah. Yeah, I think perhaps this is a, um, um, also a, something of the new times we do live in that we ask such questions. Um, I remember uh, Kami from the uh, laundromat projects that we produce and produce so many things. But we never ask each other, how, how are you doing? What's going on? And as you said, we create spaces, 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 but perhaps we didn't fully ask, well, what about the kid that has to be displaced? We kind of think they're talking about it, but we didn't really ask and we didn't really listen. And I think uh, when people also about, you know, about diversification of institutions, we also say, yes, it's important, but did we really listen to what people were saying? And what, what are we going to change? And the hope is that this, this, if, this is a different uh, a moment. So, so my question to all of you is, do you see your art as a practice, uh, as an aesthetic practice, as a practice that, you know, explores century old, uh, pursuit of mankind, of colors, form, uh, um, connections, giving meaning. Do you also see it strongly also as a, as a political work? You know, is it part of a, what for a social change? Um, is it in between or, um, or do you separate these and say, well, I'm, I'm delivering mask, I'm delivering mask. If I do a play, I'll do a play. So what, what, what are your thoughts on your work? How do you put this puzzle together, everybody? 
us to think, truly really think about how, how is it for you individually? Um, if I, I actually have a response to that because um, going off of what Dana said, um, I appreciate those words so much because I think, you know, as artists, as creators, like we can't just think about the aesthetic, think about the creation of work. Um, we have to go a step further and think about how that work then changes the way that people outside of the arts um, are looking at the, the things or the world and, and the way that things are happening in the world around us. Um, and that goes into thinking about community and the way in which your work engages community, but also the way in which your work prioritizes community. Um, and so, you know, within my work, I'm speaking to my community, I'm speaking to Black queer women, but I'm also thinking about the ways in which my work can support Black queer women and those communities and, and make sure that I'm making space, not just for myself as an artist to create, but making space for other voices to be heard that are just regular people who are not artists, you know, and who are going through daily struggles um, and having to deal with those struggles alone most of the time. Um, and so I think as artists, like especially right now in the year 2020, a lot of people are kind of changing the dynamics of their practice and the way that they're thinking about the creation of work, because it's, it's beyond just the creation of work right now. It's, it's, it's mostly about working to, to change like systems um, and, and make these demands. And, and I think as artists and creators, we have that power to really put a, a spotlight on a lot of the issues that are happening and, and actually make those demands and, 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 and kind of create this catalyst for change. Um, just, like I, I also forgot to mention that in terms of like space in the city, I am also in, you know, despite like, uh, like this space work that I mentioned being shut down, um, I'm also in a studio share, a music studio share um, in a really, really old building right on 8th Avenue. It's like really close to Port Authority. I think it's been there since like the 1940s, 1950s, like the, the elevator barely works. Um, but it's an amazing building. It's, I think, eight floors of six or seven studios in each floor. Um, and they're all music studios. It's very drummer heavy um, because of all the drummers who can practice in the city. But it's an amazing building. I have no idea who owns this, but I'm pretty sure that the rent for each room is stabilized. Um, but yeah, I have no idea who owns this building. I, I hope it continues to exist. Um, yeah, so that's definitely in contradiction to like a lot of the newer spaces that I've seen and been in. Um, in response to whether I see like art or more especially my art as like more of an aesthetic purely thing or a political thing. I, I've thought about this question quite a bit and especially in the past few months as well. And I think I just came to the conclusion that um, well, firstly, I just think my forte or like my strength is not in being overtly political. Like even if I tried to be, I just would not know how to be. I just, it's just not, not in me. I do not know how to make overtly political art. And then the second thing was that um, I kind of realized that I think all art is political. Like whatever I say, like if I do a show, like um, a story about a, a boy who wants to go get a fish, he goes to the river, he can get a fish. Like that, that, that is political. You could read that in a political sense. So I feel like even without me trying to make something political, it's going to be political anyway. And, and I think that the thing that um, I feel most strongly about is that for me, I feel like a lot of my friends or the theater world is kind of very, I would almost say like we kind of all believe the same things already very much like speaking back to like the whole 2016, like the whole echo chamber idea where like we're all, we all thought, you know, everyone thinks the same way, but it was just that we were all in the same bubble. And so for me, I think like, let's say I want to try to convince someone that the sky is blue. I, I would not like, you know, make a piece called the sky is blue because then people who think the sky is yellow would be like, you, you're crazy. And like, be like, bye. Um, I might make a piece about, colors of the rainbow and then you know i could 
you know, potentially invite this person to be like, hey, here's a piece about colors of the rainbow. It has nothing to do with the color of the sky. Um, and in that sense, I feel like I could reach people who do not necessarily agree or are even open to anything that I personally believe in. Yeah. Dina. It's, I don't think my art is an entirely aesthetic thing. And I think it's just, it's mainly because of the ways in which I navigate art, especially as someone who is Southeast Asian, as someone who is Muslim um, and talks about those things. It's hard for it to not be political. Of course there is an aesthetic to it, there's a beauty to it. But I think also at the same time, especially as a poet, choosing what I get to portray, choosing what I aestheticize, choosing what I romanticize, similar to what Yuji has said before, like that is also political especially as someone like for me, I'm diasporic, I'm first generation. Like if I talk about my mother or if I talk about my aunt, like I have to also be aware that while I aestheticize them in a particular way that also to some degree, I don't wanna say removes their agency, but I'm the main vessel and I have to acknowledge the privileges that I have in doing that as an artist, but also kind of as someone who is born and raised in America and like an understanding that like because I'm under this colonial empire like that is always going to be kind of prioritized so in short I think it's a combination of both but I think I have to be very mindful on in the factors when it is aesthetic yeah um it's it's also a question I ask myself all the time and I think I don't have a clear answer to it yet. I think it's a, it's a combination as well. It's, it's kind of an opportunity to have a conversation um, where the other person doesn't respond though. So it's kind of like weird, but there is, there is a, a desire for change and a desire to, to tell a story that there's something deeper within it. <laughs> yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really um, a significant uh, question. Uh, one of the things we had Florian Malzacker, who was a, a German curator, and he wrote a book uh, currently on the, on the political. And he said, what he detects as the most significant change is that is about the how you do your work. He said it used to be just the content, you know, you, let's say you did something about child soldiers in Africa, about the uh, destruction of an environment through an oil company, and it was good enough. But still, it was written by one playwright, directed by a director who was, you know, a, a dictatorial style, you know, who in the world we live in now would look very at his. And so it's a hierarchical uh, presentation within a machine of a theater that actually represents the system, especially in America. It's privately owned. It's to make as much money as possible, you know, in, the, in Broadway at least. Uh, what's successful is good. What's not successful is not good as if in a bookstore you would only have books who are top 10 books, you know, or the top 20 and you wouldn't have the other ones available. And um, so he says that, you know, the way you create work in ensemble, he said there's a tendency that there's ensembles who work together, even two directors, three directors now, uh, curatorial things are two or three people. Um, that there's a distribution of the text where actors can, like when they polish at the Volksbühne, where you can choose what part they want or they write something on it. And he says, if I come in as the director and I tell them what to do, I'm paid more. I create a lead character. I lead the second and the third. I am reproducing structures. We actually are opposed to it and my entire play is against it, but I do the same on stage. So do you feel... Or do you, is that part of your thinking, the way you produce your work, the way you implement it, all the stuff we don't, so do you, are you rethinking that? Is that also, is that something you can say, yes, that's true, or uh, do you think it's not part of your, um, 
part of, not, not, not part of your consideration and say we just the, the, the what I put out is significant and I think about it a lot and I feel like every day I'm rethinking it I think I think in that similar way in terms of like what does it mean to be an artist that is against certain structures, but then also implementing other structures is tricky. And I think while like I'm mainly, mostly in poetry, like you see it in those systems too, like um, in the poetry realm, for instance, like there's a lot of conversations about tokenism and like the roles in which like elitism and classism play into, um, play into the practice, right? So for me as a writer, but also kind of delving a little bit into theater, sometimes I wonder like, what does it mean to kind of engage in art itself? And specifically, what does it mean to engage in art in America? And especially like as a person of color in terms of what does it mean to always be hurt by different traumas and systemic things, but also not reenacting them, but still talking about them certain ways. And like, what does it mean, for instance, too, for um, in a lot of our institutions and a lot of artistic structures, for us to be against the system and the social systems that are in place, but then also oftentimes for youth writers, like we kind of force youth BIPOC to kind of remind their trauma um, in hopes that like they will get a footing or set foot into, um, these industries and in these practices. And then another thing of what does it mean whenever I do engage in trauma at all? What systems are in place in, for, in order for me to write these poems? What systems are in place and what are the things that have happened prior before me in terms of generationally? What wars have occurred? What forms of colonialism have occurred? What roles of classism and elitism have happened in order for me to like not only just be a writer, and have the privilege of being a writer, but also at the same time, like being able to be, to write about these things, but being seen not as a spokesperson, but as someone where it's like, okay, if she says it, then it must be true. So that's something I've kind of been interrogating in terms of like the privileges of like what it means to be an artist and rethinking how much authority an artist has in a particular sense. Yeah, I also think 100% in collaboration. I'm a fan of collaboration and the ideal world for this project in terms of keep on developing, it would be like, take me to a house upstate with a dramaturg, a playwright, five actresses, a video designer, a sound designer, and we'll create from the beginning of it all together. And as a director, I can facilitate ideas and like organize in a way that we can try different things, but then the best one will remain. And it won't be my idea. It won't be maybe the actor's idea. Maybe it's the sound designer's idea, but we've all created this world together. But of course that is like, I can dream about it. Now, how do I actually get the budget to do this, you know? So those are things that's beautiful to dream about it, but is it possible? Is this possible? But yeah, collaboration a hundred percent. I totally, yeah, I definitely work in the same way. Like I love collaborating. Um, I'm definitely still, and I've been on both sides, like as a music director of an, or in a company where I'm like kind of serving someone else's vision and composing or arranging according to what someone else wants. And then also been on the other side where I'm like, okay, this is the idea. Um, but I've also kind of struggled or I'm still learning how to be like, this is the idea. Let's bring in a group of people to kind of fill in, make this idea or this universe larger or to kind of fill in that little universe or tie in something that I did not think could be tied in. And then me having to go, okay, now stop. This is where we are going like for this project or like this project at this time, this is this is what we're doing. Um, is something that I'm definitely learning. And I guess going back to like, if I'm going to work in a different way when whenever this thing is over. Um, so two of my actors are also not in New York. Um, 
but I mean, I, it's great that we could work on this, but I definitely think that, I mean, as actors and like people trained to like, you know, read body language and who are very sensitive to body language, like it's just completely different um, when you're working with someone and all you see is like this and you don't even know how tall the person is or like, you know, where their feet are, like, are their feet pointing towards you? Or are they like pointing towards the door? Like, I wanna leave, I hate you. It's like, you can't, you know, it's, it's so much better to just be in the room. And I feel like we're all great at already doing that. So like having to train yourself to be like, let's try and read this person's mood from like what's in the background is like, just does not work for me. So going forward, like, I, I don't think I'll be collaborating di digitally. Um, but there have also been instances where I've like kind of composed music for a friend's dance film and that worked totally smoothly. Like, I guess also because, you know, I'm composing off something that was made for the screen and that collaboration is not so, it doesn't need such a direct sensitive collaboration. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna add about uh, the idea that uh, Dana brought up about challenging our privilege and, and being able to challenge that. I think like you have to go through this process of continuously checking yourself and making sure that you're not taking too much authority over like the creation of something. I mean, I think a lot about like my work, I, it's always like putting myself in front of the camera and becoming the subject. And in that process, like going through this process of kind of questioning my own authority over like my own feelings, my own body, um, and like le leaning more so into this vulnerable state um, allows this kind of connection um, with others. And that can become like a collaborative process. Uh, but also thinking about in this idea of like challenging privilege, your own privilege and how you kind of fit into like certain systems and how you can reciprocate or perpetuate certain systems of oppression. Um, thinking about like challenging standards, challenging the way that you think of things. Um, I've been having this constant conversation about reclamation versus just claiming um, and thinking about this idea of not necessarily centering whiteness and thinking about reclaiming a story or a narrative from um, the starting point of whiteness, but thinking about just claiming what already is, you know, and thinking about my identity as a Black woman, claiming that and thinking about the ways in which Blackness has always been a starting point and will be, be continuously a point of reference forever. Um, and so like constantly grappling with that. I feel like that's always been a part of my process. And I've been doing more work into letting more people into that process of questioning. Um, because I think when people understand like as an artist, it's not just about your end product, it's about kind of what you're doing in the process of creating that. Um, they can see that like the same things that I'm struggling with and dealing with in this process of creating are, are similar to maybe what someone is dealing with on a, a regular everyday basis. Um, so I think that's that's an important part of just you know, being vulnerable and allowing people into kind of what you're doing and what you're thinking and what you're creating. Yeah. I think, um, and in terms of like, I think it was also funny that, you know how there's like quarantine bubbles now. And I think like, I, I was observed, I, you know, I was reading about this and it kind of, I thought it was funny because there's like a parallel between like, you know, what Stefania was saying, like getting a group of artists going to an upstate house and like making work um that seems like a strange parallel to like oh let's all quarantine ourselves and um you know only interact th with these people and i think it was i think brian brooks um his dance company is currently doing that or like they have just done that i think at jacob's pillow or something like that where their whole company has been you know both it's almost like a forest i guess a forest like arts residency where you're only where you can only interact with your fellow artists not because uh, it's an arts residency, but because you, you can bring the illness in to the rest of uh, the company, which I think there's just something funny there. And also speaking to the point about like, um, you know, accessibility, I think, I think there was a push kind of a few months ago um, of like the critics at New York Times being kind of all the same, you know, the same kind of profile, the same kind of people. and. I used to think that like these people just like 
because I I don't because I personally don't read the New York Times to tell me what theater to what show to go see. Um, so I kind of thought, oh, I, I mean, I don't really care. But then I started to hear from directors um, and friends that were like, I'm so concerned that my show is gonna be like misunderstood or like they're not gonna get it. And I'm like, and these director friends are like, and this will actually affect my career in a big way. And I and I never realized that. And yeah, and I think they still, from what I heard last, um, I don't think anything has changed um, on that front. So yeah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, truly, I think, in a way, taking uh, the temperature before we come to an end. Maybe uh, all of you say, uh, I, I know this is a project in development and it's not even done, but what else do you have uh, cooking uh, on your stove? I'm sure our, um, our um, audiences you know, will, be, will be interested, you know, maybe mention the website where we can find, but what are your projects? And then also I would like to hear what inspires you at the moment? Like, do you listen to music? Is there a poet you read? Is there a, a novel, or is there what? What, including you, David? What, what? What do you say? Well, this give me a moment of uh, enlightenment or something. So uh, both. So what are you working on? What's inspiring you, or are other artists? Yeah. Maybe you'll start, Stefania. And what do you think? Um, it's been long weeks of editing videos. So at the moment I was like, I don't know what is inspiring me. I just, I'm on the computer 24 hours, but yeah, um, I think the projects I'm working on at the moment inspire me. I'm, I'm doing video design for an experimental uncle Vanya at Fordham and going on to a project end of December, um, doing some video design as well. So I mainly, I'm on the computer too many hours editing. Just like the silence of going to my bed and just being like, okay, now shut down. It doesn't, but I think my bed inspires me. Good, yeah. It's a Corona statement, yeah. yeah. You, uh, um, you uh, another project that I've been working on, um, it's an old idea that I've had that I never thought, that I thought I would work on three years later or something because it's so expensive to do. But then I thought during this time is kind of relevant. Um, it's, a, no, it's a theater show with no actors. Um, it's like lights moving across furniture, furniture moving across the stage and music driving the whole thing. It's about an artist trapped in her apartment during the Spanish flu and um, having no access to clients, she paints a self portrait for the first time. Um, I would never have worked on this now because it's so expensive because it's all like, you know, set pieces and puppetry and stuff like that. But um, I also wanted it to have only one audience member in like a 200 seat theater to highlight that element of loneliness and just, um, you know, the work of art, which is the title. Um, but so it seems like it might be relevant now. Um, so I am working on it now. Um, oh, in terms of what inspires me now, um, I've been listening to a lot of music because I've been composing music for this uh, prelude piece. Um, I think one song that I've been thinking about a lot in particular is Benjamin Clementine's uh, Phantom of Aleppoville. Um, I love his songs. It's a great job, blend of genre. I love him as an artist. I think he's so good um, and very interesting. Um, and I guess similar to Stefania, I've, I think I've also just been inspired in moments where I force myself to sit there and not think about, not be doing something. Because I think, I think everyone is kind of like in a state of elevated stress these days. And so it's easy to just be like, just engage me in something, anything, you know, I don't want to have to think about anything. Um, but when you actually, when I actually force myself to be like, okay, just like stop and do nothing. Um, that has been when kind of, I, you know, more ideas of value come to mind for me. Yeah. David. Um, 
I'll go. I'll go last because I want to close. I would need to say some things about the festival overall. You can do that afterwards. Tell you, tell oh me. well. One of the things I'm inspired by a couple of things. I, I'll throw some couple. I mean, in the last um, six months, I've really been thinking about General Baker, who was uh, this kind of formative figure in the what's often called the Black Radical tradition. He was an organizer in based in Detroit, and he he worked in in a Dodge car plant, and he led a series of wildcat strikes, which are you know you don't have the permission of the union, you just leave. You can think of the NBA strike as a kind of version of a wildcat strike. And he saw, I mean, I'm totally stealing this from Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, these two very great uh, critics and thinkers about um, various forms of systemic injustice. And, you know, General Baker saw no contradi contradiction in working for Dodge and trying to bring down Dodge. And, because, and part of it was because he liked being around workers. And for me, you know, I've felt a lot of contradiction you know, obviously, of course, informed by my own position, I sit at almost every vector of privilege, and I need to take responsibility for that. But I, I have, I have grown comfortable sitting in the contradiction that I want to bring down or completely rebuild the theater industry, while at the same time working and benefiting from that industry. And part of it because I want to be with artists and arts workers, including everyone on this call. So, General Baker's example, he passed away um, several years ago, but he. He has loomed large in my imaginary by way of Moten and Harney. So that's been really inspiring to me over the last um, six or seven months. Yeah, thank you. Dina. Okay, in terms of projects, I'm working on a docu-theater slash documentary comic book thing um, that centers around a particular high school in Brooklyn and kind of just the roles in which race and class like played into this particular school. I can't necessarily say the name at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I guess, ongoing, and I don't know if I'm obnoxious for doing this to slowly bring up my book, but you can buy it, SPD. Cool. Um, don't yeah. buy it at Amazon. Um, in terms of what I'm inspired by, I've been listening to a lot of music, but specifically I've been like listening to 2000s pop, music and R&B music and I feel like I feel like lately there's been a like an interest in like how great of a decade that was the early 2000s but I feel like no one really talks about how unique it was in terms of millennium pink and like um baggy pants and like just the style and the aesthetic of it and like clear transparent technology so I've just been really excited because like when I was younger, I really wanted to dress like that, but also like, I just feel like it puts me in a really great time. And it also like, I also feel like people don't talk enough about how the early 2000s was like a decade of remixing in the best way. So I feel like it's inspired my art in ways of like trying to figure out ways of repurposing different things and repurposing different narratives and things like that, but also fashion, you know, yeah. So maybe it's time for you to write a play or a screenplay, like my wonderful laundronette to capture <laughs> what you say of the 2000, of the historical uh, decade that's already so far, far behind us. It, it's stunning. So really, um, ah. thank you all. And um, it's a it's significant, important uh, discussion, you know, also about po the political. And uh, on one hand, yes, all art is political, but some artists do political art, you know, so if we say everything is sometimes we take also something away from them who dedicatedly and very clearly say this is political. So we, but both is true, you know, I think every uttering and statement, you know, of course, by definition um, is, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm stunned, you know, by all of you and the, the engagement, uh, you know, the Gia who says, well, I didn't know about the emojis I found out, but it's actually I could do a Hollywood film, you know, that you find that out, that Stefania has an actor in Argentina go down the step in your video, you know, and the one from whatever, Brazil comes up and they look in the same space, but they are uh, together. So something is happening. And uh, Dina, who, you know, created that, that chamber piece in a way it is, you know, in a colonial heavy bed, you know, where she talks about such, the most private, intimate moments, but they are so, so political, so, so, uh, so um, connected to history, but as well as uh, to, 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 to um, how we are and, and uh, Landra's work. So, um, and uh, how to reflect on that and to engage with community. So I think it's a real uh, kaleidoscope and we really have to listen closely what everybody said here. And um, 
because there is something in there that might save us that will help us to understand the world and also to engage in whatever they think about you know it's also we should ask us those questions what have we done how do we produce work how are we with our neighbors how you know how do we listen to stories so we understand what perhaps we might convey in messages and neighborhoods we move in and uh, and all of it so really um thank you this was a very significant talk it was an honor to have you all with us and i hope that festival also gave you a moment and time to you know create something show it and then you go on to the next one that the process is of significance um because as some say the goal lies in the way so sometimes what you want to do is is in between what you want to achieve is you know it's the opposite so david um tell us uh, what's happening at prelude today and uh, and and everything and what do you think of the festival um Oh, wait, I want to give one thing. Leandro, did you get a chance to talk about your inspiration? I can't remember if we touched you or if I blanked out thinking about what I was going to say. No, I didn't get a chance to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I was writing long, but go ahead. I want to hear it's, it. It's totally fine. Um, I want to also plug for uh, Dana. You should follow by Sean Brown, who's totally into the 2000s movement, and it's incredible. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, right now I'm just thinking about the abstraction of language. Uh, so uh, been rereading Audre Lorde, um, also thinking about a book by Robin Cost Lewis, uh, Voyage of the Sable Venus that I always think about um, in, in regards to poetry, language, the abstraction and how you can kind of bring words to together to create this movement. Um, and then in regards to music, which has always been a huge influence for me, um, I, I've been listening to Sun Ra on repeat, um, Alice Coltrane and Farrell Sanders uh, are just a few that just constantly like bring you back to, again, this, this movement of rhythm, language, and sometimes even the absence of language and how beautiful that can be. Um, and I'm going to just do a, a my piece is premiering tonight uh, on Prelude's website at 8 p.m. Passing Time with Grace. So if anyone's uh, able to, to check that out, please do. And I'm so thankful for it as well. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and thank you all. You know, we have, as um, Landra kind of intimated, we have a marathon lineup today. So Penny Thoughts, uh, which is an encaps a video kind of reflection on a project that's ongoing that you can check out on Instagram. Um, is happening at five and then it, it will be available uh, Animal Empire uh, by our very own Eugia and uh, her collaborator Justin Aaron Hall uh, will be at uh, 530 and then we have a performance at 630 called Body 100 uh, collaboration between Garrett Allen and uh, Nazareth Hassan and then Landers piece at, at eight passing time with Grace which I can't wait and then um, at nine o'clock May Ann Teo is concluding her two week long project called Hold um, in which she uh, has been inviting, well, she's holding space for meditation. It's about 25 minutes. And at the end, uh, she's invited a series of speakers whom she calls queer holies to give a, a prayer to close the event. So I'm not sure who um, is is speaking tonight. Oh, it's uh, Naya Witherspoon. So um, please check that out. And then the festival, some of it will be available forever. Some of it will, will have to come down. Um, but the website is there, preludenyc2020.com. And you can see the work of all these wonderful artists. So thank you all. Thank you, Frank. Um, it's been great to kind of co-host the last week with you. Um, I'm not sure how much I brought to the equation, but uh, it's just been great to bear witness to, to this, this enterprise. And thank you and Miranda, you know, for, for all the work you did for the Fado, for the Prelude Festival. It's really, it's really an experiment. It's very open, like these talks. And I think it's remarkable, um, the group of people, artists you brought together, the conversations you all generated, the idea of the site, and the website to take it serious, this kind of retro Mac into early Mac look, you know, what you, you created for the website and, uh, and the quietness also of the pieces, lots of them, you know, they were not screaming and attention and Broadway and entertainment, they were often like radio plays, they were small pieces or not long. So you can really, I felt, get a sense of, of, of the atmosphere of the moment um, we are in, which also is something of significance to capture that. And there's a variety of voices that also make clear, really clear statements. So um, you did great and um, I'm really proud of uh, you as curators having put that together. So um, this is an important thing for us at the Seagull and this festival, it's the biggest event of the year and uh, the most significant one. So if, and we, we give it to people really as a full free white page to create something or carte blanche. So it's um, 
as, as something. And is there a celebration at the end? And will there be? Yes, there is a party, although I don't think it's, it's not open to the public. Our uh, team has put it together. And I'll quickly say thank you to our, our entire team. As I've said on these other talks, I'm merely an emanation of a larger ensemble. You know, I'm, I'm standing in for a group of people making it happen all the time. Not only my co-curator, Miranda Heyman, but the producers, uh, Samuel Morreale, Sammy Pine, uh, Lucy Powis, uh, our graphic designer, Lena Mitchell, and our website developer, Lorena uh, Ramirez Lopez, who made magic on WordPress happen, uh, as long as our collaborators at the Seagull Center, not only Frank, but Andy Lerner as well. So, uh, and our stage manager, Harry, who is amazing at calling cues on Zoom. Um, so uh, he should really publish something about, about using the chat feature. But um, so thank you. Thanks to all those people as well. Incredible. A two-week festival today already is the, is the last day. It's coming to an end. Um, and that might be is a, a good thing for this, this time of prelude and the current uh, political regime. Uh, all, all things come to an end if they're good things or bad things. So, uh, and I hope um, this is a good thing that comes to an end, but I hope also that what's bad and insufferable will come to an end. So thank you all. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us. See ya, DJ and everybody, Travis. So uh, thank you and stay safe and stay tuned. Next week we have uh, with us Karen Malti, Malpete and uh, George Batania, two actors or writers who have uh, you know, their work focused on the political playwrights. On the day after the election, we'll have uh, Simon Dove from ArtsLink, um, and the idea of radical hosting, something they, they feel strongly about. What does that mean? Maybe this is a way to change our neighborhoods. It's also something of a significance for the performance world. How do we engage um, with, with the people? And then uh, we have uh, the great Susan Feldman who runs St. Dan's Warehouse. And let's hear what's on her mind. How is she coping with the situation? What are the plans? What are the realities of running such a place? So um, thank you, thank you. Stay safe, stay tuned. And uh, I can't wait for today of the trailer. Thank you.